care of. If you would please fill this out, put it in, uh, put it in the offer clip when it comes around. Promise you we're not gonna spam call you and and leave you voicemails all the time or send you weird texts in the middle of the night or anything like other spam callers do. We might send you uh, a letter to see how you're doing. But we we ask if you are visiting, please fill this out, put it in the offering plate. And for any of you at home, if you would like to receive this too, shoot us an email or message us, and we'll be glad to get with you. Everybody have a great day of worship. Thank you. You know, we have a hard time as Christians and as followers of Jesus sometimes letting things go. We want to hang on to stuff. Sometimes it's the bad things we want to hang on to. It's sometimes difficult to say, yes, Lord. But that's the most blessed thing you could ever do is just say, yes, Lord. Lord, I, whatever God is asking of you in your life, say yes. Say yes is the best way to go. Why? Because he knows something you don't know. And so you need to say yes. Stand together. Let's worship him as we say yes, Lord. Oh.
You don't need any of this. All you need is the map. But the map is the one thing she said we didn't need. Sure. There are those on the journey upward who think they need all this equipment, but in the end, all you need is the map. And why would you bring water when the map can guide you to wells? The tank. We have to bring the tank. The map will show you all. Sure, you can bring all this excess baggage if you like, but all it's going to do is slow you down. In the end, all you need is the map, yourselves, and me. Stick with all this, and you can go higher than you ever imagined. Well, how do we start? Drop all your things, follow me. That's it. That's it. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go. scripture this morning. I want you to follow along as we choose the right guy this morning. In April 2014, J.R. Kimbler planned a quick nature hike with his two children, Dakota, age 10, and Jade, age 6. They drove to Congaree National Park down outside of Columbia. He took no snacks, no water, no asthma medication for his daughter, or even a map into the 27,000 mile square national park. He got out onto the trails and he said that they got confused with some of the markings and some of the signage on the trails. And then it didn't help that a storm had come through and knocked down a lot of the trees, making it very hard to navigate. And sure enough, the three of them found themselves lost in the middle of this expansive national park. Nighttime was starting to come, the sun was setting, and so he did uh, the only thing he knew to do. He pulled out his phone and he sent out one last text message asking for help. And as soon as he did, his phone died. Sure enough, they spent the night out in the elements that evening. They woke up the next morning thirsty. And he made a decision. He decided that he would he head due east from where they were. Little did he know that he was just heading deeper into the vast extent of that national forest. They, of course, got thirsty. They got so thirsty that they decided to drink water out of some stagnant pools that they found pulling out the debris and the leaves out of that water to drink. They found themselves spending the night, the night, a second night, out in the national forest. They woke up the next morning. Of course, they were dead hungry. And they looked around. They found a wild turkey in the nest and scared that wild turkey off the nest, hoping to eat the eggs. But to much of their chagrin, those eggs were developed too much for them to eat. He feared for their life and his own life, thinking if we have to spend another night out in the wilderness that they would perish from exposure. And they laid their heads down on the ground that night, praying that God would intervene. At 4.20 the next morning, they heard a voice screaming their names. It was a ranger, Jared Gutler, who had found them sleeping two miles from the visitor center. JR's cell phone message had kicked off a 60-man, three-day manhunt for him and the kids. The ranger tossed them some water and told them to stay put till they got help to them. But JR recounts saying, I ain't staying anywhere. I'm coming to your voice. I've been, we've been stuck here for three days. At daybreak, the rangers reached them with ATVs and took them back to the visitor center. Kimbler says that he could not stop crying. I quote, I love every one of you, he told the rangers. I want to hug every single one of you right now. After a short visit to the hospital, they were fine. 
when asked what he was going to do with the kids the next weekend, he said, we'll probably go roller skating indoors in the air conditioning. <laughs> J.R. Kimbler was in need of a good guide. He was a very bad guide. He was unprepared and helpless. He was unable to help himself, unable to help his children, and he lacked what he needed. <coughs> the right guide makes all the difference. I don't know about you, but even from uh, when I was a younger kid, I remember we went to a national park and there was a ranger, and we'd go on a, a tour or a hike. I would always say, right close to the ranger. There were several reasons for that. One, they had funny stories, and I wanted to hear all the funny stories. But not only that, but they knew the way. I didn't want to get lost. They knew the dangerous parts of the path. They knew where to be careful and where to show you where to walk and how to walk. They knew the dangerous animals that were out there and how to deal with them. If we came across a snake or something else like that, I knew that the ranger would know what to do. Picking the right guide is important. As we continue our study of Daniel, we're going to see two people. One person is going to choose the wrong guide. And the other, the right guide. So let's take a look at Daniel 2 together. We're going to start with verse 1 through 13. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. That the king commanded that the magicians, and the enchanters, and the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in, stood before the king, and the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O oh, king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show you the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruin. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell the servants the dream, and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time, because you see that the word for me is firm. If you do not make this dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the time changes. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult. And no one can show it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious, and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out that wise men were to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Here we see that you are not the guy. You are not the guide. Some years ago, a man named Ernest Kurtz wrote what became the definitive history of Alcoholics Anonymous, a movement called Not God. In it, he contended that alcoholics' basic problem is their refusal to acknowledge their limitations and weaknesses. They tend to live under the delusion that they are under control of everything. And even in truth, they can't even control their own themselves. Fundamental to recovery process and to the healing and to sanity begins with one single recognition. I am not God. Now, 
Nebuchadnezzar saw the world revolving around him. In ancient times, many kings claimed that they themselves were gods. And who was going to argue with them? Head of a powerful nation, head of the most powerful army on the face of the planet at the time, Nebuchadnezzar thought he was in control. He thought that people existed to make him happy. All the pleasures of this world were at his fingertips. He was fully caught up in the I am God syndrome. Many people today live under the same delusion. They may not be king or queen of a great nation, but as they live their lives, it's all about them. It's all about their needs. It's all about their desires. It's all about them first. What matters to them is what matters most. This is basically what happens when we deny God or deny his leadership. We're making ourselves God of our own lives. It all revolves around me. I decide what is right and what is wrong. I decide what I pursue after. I decide what I spend my time doing, how I behave. I am the guy for my life. Behind the very first sin that was ever committed is the same delusion. Genesis 3, 5, the serpent says to the woman, God knows that when you eat of the fruit, your eyes will be opened, and what? You will be like God. Knowing good and evil. It is the first temptation. You will be the master of your own universe. You will be like God. Basically, all of us, at one time or another, have been just like Nebuchadnezzar. We have all been the own gods of our own lives. As a matter of fact, I would contend that every single person on the face of the planet falls into one or two, one of two categories. Either you are God of your life or God. Yahweh is God of your life. I'd even contend there could be some in this very room. You may call yourself a Christian, but you've never made Yahweh Lord of your life. You've never submitted all parts of your life to him. And it plays out in all areas of your life. Are you God? Or is Yahweh God in your workplace, in your career? How about your marriage? How about your parenting? Is Yahweh God of your friendships, or are you? How about your finances, or your dating life? It's easy to say that Nebuchadnezzar, well, he was sure evil. He sure was a fool. But there are many, not a majority, who are in the exact same position. They have placed themselves as guide of their life. As Lord of their life, it's me. I'm going to make the decision about what is right and wrong. I'm going to make the decisions about how I live my life. I am going to make the decisions about how I spend my time. When we do so, we have become just like Nebuchadnezzar. We are Lord. We are God of our own lives. Let's keep reading. Verses 14 through 19. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Ariok, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Ariok, the king's captain, Why is this decree of the king so urgent? Then Ariok made the matter made known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house, and he made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, to Azariah, his companions. And he told them to seek mercy from God of heaven. 
concerning this mystery so daniel and his companions may not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of babylon then the mystery was revealed to daniel in a vision of the night that daniel blessed the god of heaven here we see that communication with the right guide gives us power communication with the right guide gives us power daniel knew that the right who the right god was so he gathered his friends he gathered his family and he petitioned them to pray daniel knew where his power came from he knew if they were going to get out of this mess it was going to be because of god because of god alone just like rj kimbler who sent out that last message it was that message that saved his and his children's life our life can only be saved by the right god by calling out to him to do what he can do that we cannot it doesn't take long to live a life being god of your own life to realize it's not going to work out it doesn't work we're terrible gods of our own lives we're sinful we mess up we make mistakes we can't even live by our own standards we're terrible at being god it's only god and give us the power to live the lives that has called us to live. When you have the right guide, you know where your power comes from. Daniel went to his close group of friends and they petitioned the Lord. Do you have a group of friends that you can go to with prayer? Who is your prayer partner? Who is that small group that you can use to infuse your life with prayer. Powerful things happen when we pray together to God to move and to act. The best antidote to worry in your life is prayer. Consider Philippians 4, verses 6 through 9. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It is prayer, this communication with the right guy that gives us the power to do what we need to do. May we never get so mature. May we never get so powerful in our own lives or so successful that we forget our need for the one who gives us power in the first place. When Lyndon B. Johnson was president, he asked Bill Moyers, his press secretary, and an ordained Southern Baptist preacher, to say the prayer at their meal one night at the White House. And so um, Bill began to pray, but he was praying really softly. It could barely be heard across the table. And so the president, Lyndon Johnson, told him, interrupted him and said, speak up. I can barely hear you. The Lord looked across the table and said, I'm sorry, sir, but I wasn't talking to you. May we, no matter how blessed we are in life, no matter what position we might reach, may we realize that we are not God. And it is only God that can give us the power we need to overcome crisis and storms in our life. Amen. Keep reading. Verses 20 through 23. Daniel answered, and he said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and you have made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Here we see we need to celebrate the guy. We need to celebrate the guy. Not too unlike Kimbler, who could not wait to be with his rescuer, who wanted to hug all the park rangers, Daniel breaks out into song 
as well. I love this. In the heart of the book of Daniel, we have this song that he wrote, a song of thanksgiving. Daniel, God gives Daniel the answer to the riddle. Not only does he know the king's dream, he knows the interpretation as well. It could have only been given by God. So Daniel, before he does anything else, he breaks out into song. Right in the middle of the story, he breaks into song. Whatever lies ahead of us, good times or bad, we know that God holds us in the palm of his hand. And it gives us reason to give glory and honor and praise and worship to our God. Amen. May we do that. Let's keep reading. Verses 24 through 28. Then Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought Daniel before the king in haste and said to him, I have found amongst the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Balthazar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God. There is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. Here we need, see, we need to point others to the God. We need to point others to the God. Daniel had a deep desire for Nebuchadnezzar to know what was unfolding right under his nose. Daniel knew God. And he wanted the king to meet his maker in a good way. Look at what he says. He, look what he tells the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. At its heart, the book of Daniel is about evangelism. Going into exile in a foreign country looked like the end of the world for Daniel and his friends. But instead, God used the situation as an evangelistic opportunity of a lifetime. When we humbly declare that I am not God, I'm lost apart from God. Our whole outlook on life changes. Not only do we experience God's grace, but we want others to experience it as well. We tell people around us, there's a God in heaven, and he reveals mysteries to me, and he wants to reveal those mysteries to you. May we devote ourselves to doing whatever it takes to point people to our Savior. When we are willing to do that, we'll take risks. We'll pay whatever the price. We'll devote ourselves to helping people meet the one and true God. Now we're going to skip over the interpretation of the dream. From verses 29 to 44, you can read what the dream is and the interpretation. Now, I encourage you to do that at home. Uh, we, for time's sake, I'm going to skip over those. Because the important part is not what the interpretation was, or what the dream was. The important part is that God provided for Daniel. God showed that he was in control. He showed that it is Nebuchadnezzar, not Nebuchadnezzar, that is Lord, that is God, but it's Yahweh. So I encourage you to read those verses this afternoon. So let's skip to verses 45. The second part of verse 45 is this. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face, paid homage to Daniel, and commanded that, commanded that the offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is the God of gods, Lord of kings, and revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and made great gifts and made him ruler over the province of Babylon and chief perfect over all the wise men of Babylon. 
Daniel made a request to the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained in the king's court. Here we see the guide will lead you to blessings. To lead you to blessings. Look at what happened because Daniel was faithful. King Nebuchadnezzar falls prostrate before Daniel. He declares, Yahweh, the Lord, God of gods, Lord of kings, Nebuchadnezzar proclaims Yahweh, the God of the tiny nation of Israel that they have conquered and brought half their people to Babylon. He declares their Lord as Yahweh, Lord of all. Now in chapter 3, unfortunately, Nebuchadnezzar is going to go back to his old ways of being and being his own God. But for now, God has once again protected Daniel and his friends, and the truth was proclaimed from the king of this pagan nation, the most powerful nation on the planet at the time, this pagan king proclaimed Yahweh. Lord of all. Second, Daniel and his friends were honored and promoted. He would stay in the royal court, as we read at the end of chapter 1 last week, for 40 years, getting his influence and his in his influence and his uh, weight to the king and the kingdom. He spoke into the culture for 40 years. He was influenced for Christ, for Yahweh, in this pagan nation. What a relief when we rest in God, being God, and understanding that we are not. It gives us great freedom. We can be free from worry. When worry comes along, we can say, you know, I'm not God of my life. I can give this to the one who is Lord, the one who is Yahweh. I lay my fears at his feet. I trust Yahweh to carry me through. You are God, and I am not. You are the guide, and I am not. We don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. When we face life's storms, when we find ourselves in a crisis, lost in the woods, we can follow Daniel's example. May we be like Johnny Kimball, May we not be like him and choose the wrong guy. May we not be like Nebuchadnezzar who chose the wrong guy. May we be like him when he did choose Yahweh as Lord. May we be like Daniel. May we recognize that we are not the guy, that there is only one God and we are not it. We can go before the guy in prayer to overcome. We can be ready to celebrate and sing God's praises when he's faithful, for he will be. We can point others to him. And we can be ready to see him bless us and have his kingdom further. All because we follow the right God. Amen. We praise him. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to worship you this morning. To take a look at what it means to follow you as our guide. Lord, forgive us when we have wringed the map from your hands and said, no, I'm going to follow my way. I'm going to determine what's right and wrong. I'm going to do what I want to do. Lord, forgive us of that. Lord, there may even be someone in this room today that's still Lord of their own life. They're still God of their own life. They're still king of their king. Lord, I pray today they will turn their life over to you. They'll let you be the guide of their life. Letting us be the guide of our life only leads to death. And you've come that we might have life and have it to the full. Have it for eternity in relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning we want to celebrate the Lord's Supper. You've been given a, uh, uh, the elements, a pre-made package. If anybody does not have that, you can raise your hand. If one of our deacons will come around. All right. Um, Sam, would you invite Dalton? Just keep your hand up, and I'll bring that to you.
Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread. After blessing it, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples. And he said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of this vine until the day when I drink it new with you in the Father's kingdom. How do we make Yahweh the Lord of our lives, the King of our lives, the Guide of our lives? We have to surrender to Him. We have to embrace what Jesus did for us on the cross. He died on the cross. He spilled His blood so we might be in right relationship. Jesus knew that in the upper room. So he gave him this clear, simple act to help remember, to help give thanks, to help reflect on what Jesus did for us as his body was broken for us on the cross, as his blood was spilt for us so our sins might be forgiven, so we might have him as our It's a remembrance. But it's also a time to reflect on our relationship with the body of Christ, this church. And he tells us in 1 Corinthians that, you know, if you're not in right relationship with somebody in church or another Christian, maybe it's best that you abstain from taking the Lord's Supper because it's more important for you to be in right relationship with your church and your fellow church members than to take part in a ritual. So I ask you to reflect in your life. Is there somebody that you need to be reconciled with? Are you in right relationship with your church? So I want Miss Barber to play just a little bit. You prepare your heart. Prepare your heart to remember what he did for us on the cross. And reflect on your relationship to the body of believers. sacrifice that you took on the cross for us. 
We want to celebrate that bond that we have together as we sing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We stand, let's sing. Bless me. Church. My name is Christopher. Uh, I would just like to bring forth to all the gentlemen in the audience, come forth when we get to Father's Day weekend. Uh, all the ladies, you can just let them go. Uh, we got them on Saturday morning, June 19th at 8 a.m. We hold the men's breakfast. We'll also do a devotional afterwards. And uh, I will be filling in just temporarily for Mr. Tim Ashford while he is away on deployment. When he returns, he will resume his duties as well. Uh, but I'm just thankful to help out from Hill and uh, honor all the fathers that day and have a enjoying breakfast. You're all welcome. If you're a guy. If you're a guy. <laughs> <laughs> so 8 o'clock um, next Saturday morning, um, breakfast. And that is for men and um, and boy, um, sons also. And, and teenage boys if they want to come. All right. Um, Sugar Creek, we are still taking cookies um, for Miss Terry Kasaya is ramming up cookies and brownies for Sugar Creek Elementary. They can be brought here to the church today, um, to the fellowship hall, and tomorrow. And the treats will be delivered on Tuesday to Sugar Creek. Next week is Father's Day, and we will have a special treat for our fathers, so we look forward for you guys to be here and come, and um, that'll be just a really great um, Sunday, so followed by breakfast on Saturday, right, Chris? <laughs> right, we will, huh? Saturday's breakfast and Sunday is a treat. <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much for being here. We both hope that you have a blessed week. Let's close in prayer and you'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for our sweet time here today between Sunday school, between our new time and prayer this morning and our worship service, Lord. You call us to be in fellowship with one another, and we pray that we are doing that and that we are using our, our time wisely praying. And Lord, we ask that as we go forth this week, some will be finishing school, and um, we pray for strength for them as we know that they are tired and weary. So we pray for those. We pray for those with health issues. We just pray that you know each one of those and that you will be continue to be the father and the healer. Lord, bless this week. Thank you for our time together. Thank you for the Lord's Supper to remember um, all that you've given to us and your commands as we go forward. Thank you so much. It's in your name we pray. Amen.